And uh, we have our second uh, VTT talk, Jan Lehtinen, who is a researcher in nanoelectronics group. And uh, Jan is going to talk about cooling where it matters. Thank you. So uh, as you all know, the cryogenic temperature, it's, it's required for all our quantum devices, at least at the moment. And uh, the infrastructure that we need for it, it's, it's quite huge. So you need one lab just dedicated for your experiments because of that. So you have these uh, big uh, dry dilution fridges at use. We want to change this picture and do the cooling uh, at solid state and at the level where we cool only the device. So this is your typical cryostat, uh, which, which you do. So your experiment is somewhere there in the middle. So it's small chips. And still you need two persons to move your radiator shields and stuff in order to get the experiment running. Our approach is a little bit different. So we, we just have a small silicon chip and we use solid state cooling. And ultimately, uh, we, we just do not need any cryoliquid or anything. We just use voltage source and electric current to cool, cool our samples. And just to compare a little bit the size. So here is Tencent coin, and you can see our cooler there. So it's smaller than a bit of the Finland. Um, just a few numbers to compare. So uh, your typical dilution fridge, it's something like six cubic meters. Our cooler would be around uh, 10 minus 10 uh, cubic meters. So, so you could fit one cooler for each person in the earth in, in the same space as, as is one of your dilution fridges. And of course, if you want to use your uh, quantum gadget in, in some uh, realistic real life media, mobile phone or whatever, you, you won't need it to be much smaller. So you need more efficient cooling. Or if we want to take it to the space, uh, we do it already with dilution fridges. Um, but it costs, of course, quite a lot. So you spend millions of euros to take this mechanical stuff out the space as you could just use smaller things. So, so we want to do solid state cooling. And uh, our first target is there at the low temperatures. So we want to cool something that's already cool. Um, for the higher temperature range, there are already some solutions available. So you can just buy off the shelf Peltier cooler, which has NMP type contacts, and you move the heat by transferring electron current. Uh, and um, uh, there you can cool maybe to 200 Kelvin from 300 Kelvin, so 100 degrees. Then there are um, research going on to bring this limit to lower. So maybe you can cool down to 10 Kelvin in future with, with these kind of coolers using molecular coolers or advanced materials. So we are, we are already really close to our targeted temperature range. Then there is also possibility for optical cooling, which can take you now at somewhere near 50 Kelvin. So that's, that's also close to the uh, coolers which, which will operate. But uh, the realistic choice at the moment is to use pulse tube cooler. So we go halfway. We use still pulse tube cooling, and then we use our solid state cooler. And this already would bring uh, plenty of benefits. So you would have a helium-3 free system. So you don't need to have this rare isotope in use, which is, of course, limited supply. The system will be a lot cheaper, a lot simpler. And uh, we can cool it down very fast when it's uh, from this 1.5 Kelvin to some sub milli Kelvin, uh, sub 100 milli Kelvin temperatures. So we have high tunability in temperature. So this is how our uh, platform looks like. You can make it in different sizes. We've made one millimeter wide uh, as the maximum, but that's not a limit. It can be 
three centimeters or whatever is needed, and you can have several stages of this. Um, how do you use it? Well, you just put your quantum gadget on top. Um, how you do it? Uh, it's, it can be prefabricated there, or you can use flip chip at the end, or whatever. It's, uh, it's really just a platform where you put stuff. Um, then uh, how it functions, or what's the operational element? Uh, it's the tunnel junctions. So we use superconductor, insulator, semiconductor junctions for cooling the device. And here are scanning electro microgaps from these. So the cooler itself is suspended by the tunnel junctions like this. And uh, there are these large electrodes coming, but the actual conduct is done only to small portion of this, this electrode area. And this now hangs the cooler suspended. Uh, then how it functions? Well, we have the superconducting on this other side, which have the superconducting, uh, so superconducting energy gap, uh, and you can uh, transfer electrons to there. So if we have uh, now metal on, on the other side and there is no bias, there is no electrons transferred between these two. But if we bias it a bit, so change the chemical potential of the silicon, we can move the most energetic electrons out from the silicon and then also transfer heat out from the silicon to the superconductor and cool the uh, suspended uh, cooler. Uh, then what limits our cooling is the phonon transport from the environment to back to our cooler. And uh, there also uh, the junction is important. So we have only these tiny contacts to the, to the cooled object. Uh, there is a lot of phonons coming through these relatively hot leads, but only a small fraction of those can pass through the through the junction, because we have two dissimilar materials there between. So there is so-called capitza resistance at the interface. And then again, uh, we can even make it better when we reduce the junction size. Even less of the phonons can enter the area where they could get to the actual silicon pillar. And also, uh, still, we can maintain good electrical conductivity. So the electrons can, can uh, escape there. So we have these long, uh, large uh, phonons, which take plenty of space, and then electrons which have really uh, short mean free path. So uh, the electrons are free to move, but the phonons can get there. Uh, we can even get the situation better by nanostructuring, making some uh, uh, places there on the electrode that will reflect the phonons back before even reaching to the junction area or build up some defects within the material that will reflect the phonons back. Um, so we've done some experience on these type of structures. So this uh, was about heating up the uh, actually the cooler and inspection inspecting how, how it relaxes back to the path temperature. And there we can get uh, the thermal um, resistance between the path and the object. And um, our results show that the thermal boundary uh, being this number here uh, uh, is of the order which you would expect from this Kapitza resistance. So the Kapitza resistance, this boundary between the tunnel junction and, and our cool object uh, determines now almost solely the thermal conductivity between these two objects. And that's, of course, something that, that we want to see. Uh, then we've uh, done some cooling experiments with these first devices. So we are able to cool down roughly 100 millikelvins at 200 50 millikelvin temperature. This means something reduction of about 40% uh, uh, relative to the uh, starting temperature. So it's uh, it's it's not yet at the target figures, but um, um, we have made simulations about improved 
uh, designs, which will be these kind of cascades that you have multi multi stages there with different superconductors and different uh, size junctions. And there we can go from uh, above 1 Kelvin, so from roughly 1.5 Kelvin down the sub uh, 100 millikelvin range. And this already would be sufficient that you can use the pulse tube cooler for your free cooling and then just go solid state all the way down to the temperatures you do your experiments in. Uh, then another potential near them application uh, is polometer or calorimeter utilizing this, this uh, structure. So basically we just put antenna there as our gadget on top of the device and then make it so that it uh, captures certain frequency range. And if we do that, um, we'll, we'll get polometer that would be uh, fairly good. So here, here are our simulated numbers. So we can go below the limit which is required for the most sensitive detectors that are planned to be made. So this kind of space borne uh, uh, detectors. And uh, we can make it so that we use the self-cooling ability of the cooler. So the, our cooler can be at quite high temperature and we use the cooling to bring it down uh, to low temperature and we get the good sensitivity there. Uh, then at future, um, we, we are going to take this to 3D basically, so build it up also vertically, not only horizontally as we do now. And with this method you can of course use the space much more efficiently and have even more of these stages available. So if you build 50 stages, for example, you don't need to cool too much between each stage and still you get huge temperature reduction. So what we've done is to uh, develop really compact and efficient cooling solution. And uh, this also functions as fundamental um, uh, for fundamental studies of heat conduction, both phonon and electron channels. And uh, uh, this would be ideal platform for, for polymetry because of its self-cooling ability and uh, the, uh, possibility to tailor the heat conductivity but very well so thank you very interesting talk uh, could you please I explain why there is a minimum when you plot the cooling power versus uh, reservoir temperature. What is the mechanism, mechanism that this power, uh, this cooling power becomes smaller at lo either lower temperature or higher temperature? Yeah. Thank you. So the lower temperature here in our case, it's the quasi particles that are there. So, so we, we get this tail because um, um, the superconductor is not ideal, basically. Uh, then on the high side, that, that's because of our superconducting energy gap. So our thermal energy starts to be so large that we get, again, uh, this extra electric current. So we can't use the gap any more efficiently for cooling. So there is this kind of sweet pop spot in temperature where you, where you get the best cooling. Okay, so thanks for the talk. I had, uh, one comment, well, uh, well, one question about the um, uh, no reciprocity of the phonon transport to the junction when you showed that picture. Uh, so, okay, perfect. Yeah. The, or this one is the same. So the, the question is, uh, okay, you have engineered this junction in such a way that phonons cannot come in, uh, but then when you have phonons inside that are the ones that want to you want to cool. I mean, are you relying on the fact that the, the material is such that you have very fast recombination and phonons inside give energy to the electrons, which are the ones that you pump? Um, yeah, in, in principle, in, inside the cooler, we want to have as good phonon-electron coupling as possible. So we, we w want these electrons to couple there inside the pillar well. And of course, we don't want um, phonons to escape there either. So it's... 
Yeah. So two, two separate systems in phonon type as possible. Okay, let's thank the speaker. Okay.